Welcome to the Faith Dialogue Podcast with your host, Pastor Ken Baer. Are you ready to swim in the deep end of the Bible pool or climb to the top of Faith Mountain? If so, open the eyes that see, those ears that hear, and a heart that is receptive. Get your cup of coffee and your Bible as we begin. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you that uh, it's again, it's a Wednesday and we're opening up the scriptures and we love going through these parables. It's the words of Jesus in red and they teach us so much. Sometimes they're easy to understand. Today's is relatively easy to understand. We know what the context is, but every time we read these things, there's things that we can learn. Help us to be a better, um, a better person, exactly who you want us to be and how we should conduct our, ourselves. So Lord, we give you all the praise and the glory for everything that you do. Thank you, Lord, for Windsor, for the hospitality, for the residents here, the great care that they're given. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are in, this is, uh, doesn't say what it is, this is Luke chapter 18 verses uh beginning with verse 9. if you remember last week we did a parable also on the gospel of luke it was the first eight verses and now we're in verse 9. so how would you like to read this yes i would be happy to okay uh, also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, idolaters, and even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And then the tax collector, standing, after, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. All right. Thanks, Hal. So, so here we have a, another parable. And as you met, remember, as we've been going through these parables, one of the things that we talk about is that we always try to find the context of the parable. And the overall context of the, of the parables is found in the Gospel of Matthew when the apostles asked Jesus why he spoke so often in parables. And he said, to some it is given the, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God but to others not. So the idea is that the parables often, not all the time, but often will reveal a mystery of the kingdom of God, meaning that it's something that we get to know that really other people, even if they read it, they're not gonna understand it. Mm -hmm. And we found that so often in the parables, when we read the parable, um, we assume something because it sounds like that's the easy way to understand it. But actually, you want to go a little bit further. You want to dig in a little bit deeper and think about the kingdom of heaven and think about what it's actually like. One of the examples I often give in a, in a parable that very easily could be misunderstood is the parable of the man that found a, a, a pearl of great price. Remember that one? The pearl of great price. And he goes and finds the pearl and he says, oh, wow, this is, this is great. So he goes and sells everything he has and he pays this great price to be able to purchase the pearl. And often people will read that parable. And I've even heard some preachers preach on it. It is true how sometimes we don't get it right. But they'll, they'll preach on it and they'll say, this is an example that the kingdom of God is so precious you give up everything to be a Christian. And that's not, in fact, it's actually the opposite. It's actually the opposite. The person that's purchasing the pearl of great price is none other than Christ. Christ is the one that gave up everything. He's the one that paid it all. And the pearl of great price is actually us. Isn't that interesting? In fact, you can go one step further. And that's why I love teaching these parables. And did you know that a pearl, a pearl to the Jewish people, is considered unclean. 
You see, the, 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 the dietary laws said that the Jewish people, the Hebrews, could eat anything that had scales and, and fins. But a pearl, it comes out of shellfish, and shellfish is unclean. How even, how even better that Jesus would use the pearl as the example, because we are the unclean. We're the ones that are being purchased. We are actually not actually worthy, but God makes us worthy. He, he buys us, and he purchases us with his own blood. So that's why we, I love teaching the, the parables. I'm sorry, the, the, the parables. Because the parables often give us these little hints. Now, today's parable is a little bit easier. It's not that difficult. We, it's almost impossible to get this wrong. Although, we'll endeavor to try. <laughs> but it can, it can be done. It can be done. And I'll show you how it can be done. And, and the reason, but the reason this is so much easier is because Jesus, at the very beginning of this, tells us exactly why he's telling us this parable. He says, and he spoke, this is Jesus, this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So the purpose of this is basically directed to people that often will think of themselves as a little better than the others, that they're, they're a little closer to God. They're, they're a little more in the God side than other people. That they, and, then, and what it says is they actually despise others. They use their standard of holiness and apply it to other people and realize that those other people are falling far short of their, of their righteousness that they determine, and as a result, they hold themselves in high esteem. And they figure God agrees with them. And that's what's interesting about this parable, is that we see that there are two men that go up to the temple to pray. Two of the two men. And what's interesting is these two men are almost exact opposites. In the Jewish culture, these two men are the opposites. And Jesus has done this before. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus used the example of of a man that gets beat up and left for half dead, and a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, and a lawyer, another person of the law, a Levite, walk by and they leave the man alone. But the Samaritan, the most despised person in all of, all of Judea would be a, a Samaritan. And he's the one that does the help. So Jesus uses this. He's using extremes in order to drive home his point. Now what's interesting is that if it came to tax collectors and Samaritans, they're about the same equal because they were both despised. Remember that in the Roman system, what Rome did is when Rome came in and conquered, often they would ride in and conquer so quickly that they would just, they would almost win the war without having to kill too many people. They would just kind of overrun the country. Nobody could stand against Rome. At Rome's height, nobody could stand against Rome. Rome would come in with their army and the other people would just surrender. And they would pay tribute to Rome, and Rome would set up a kind of a puppet government, allow the local people to have some form of governance, keep their own culture, keep their own religion, but they would have to pay tribute to Rome to be able to run the empire. And the way that was done is through these tax collectors. Now, most of us don't like the IRS. I don't know too many people that like the IRS, but the IRS is really nothing, nothing like these tax collectors because the people in the IRS are paid by the IRS. They're not paid by the, the taxes they collect. But in Rome, that's exactly how these people were paid. They were, they were to extract a certain amount of tribute taxes to the Roman government, but everything they collected above that was theirs. So they would put heavy burdens on the people and they would take every amount that they possibly could. Now remember also, they weren't paid. They weren't paid. They were, they were expected to be able to take some amount of money above what they collected in taxes and, and use it for themselves. But some of these tax collectors took a lot. And of course, the people weren't very happy with Rome anyway. So nobody liked the tax collectors. It was a very, it was a, it was a job that if you were a tax collector, you didn't have a lot of friends, but you were very wealthy. You were very wealthy because you could afford almost anything you wanted to because if you needed some more money, you would just pass a few more taxes. So that's who the tax collectors are. Now let's go on the other side. The other person in this is a Pharisee. Now remember the Pharisees were at the very top of the social elite. These were people that were highly educated. They understood the law. Uh, they, they always uh, 
they always had the, the head seats at any kind of banquets. People thought of them as being very religious, closer to God. They were the ones that would basically inform the rest of the people how they were to live. Uh, some of these would, some of these that were that were Pharisees would also be connected with the temple. These were the Sanhedrin. They were in the temple, and they actually performed some of the sacrifices. The high priest was in charge of this whole process. So everything that had to do with the religious order of of of, of the Israel, of the people of Israel, was all looked to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were considered the the elite, the elite. Now Jesus didn't have a lot of good things to say about the Pharisees because the Pharisees typically did exactly as this person did. They tended to think of themselves as better than anybody else. So, so what it says is this, it says, the two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. And then it talks about the Pharisee. And he prayed thus with himself. I love that phrase. In some translation it says, it's, or it says, it says, pray to himself, pray to himself. Now what's interesting is this, here's one of our lessons we can learn. Did you know that it's possible to pray, but not pray to God, but actually pray to yourself? That's what this Pharisee is doing. Even though he's mentioning God and he's in a temple, he's really just talking about himself. He's just so impressed with himself that he's basically just reminding God of, of who he is. And his prayers, did you ever hear that saying that his prayers aren't going much higher than the ceiling? Okay, that's about as far as they're going because God really is not interested and how great this man thinks. And Jesus is using it as an example. So he says, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes on all I possess. And so he's, he's, he's enlarging himself. He's reminding God of how, how great he is. There's, there's no humility, there, there's no contrition here, there's no how, how low I am compared to how high God is. If he's in the temple to pray, that's a great opportunity for him to bring the petitions of the other people. By the way, if he was a priest, that's what the priests are supposed to do. The priests are supposed to stand in front of God and offer the petitions of the other people. The priest doesn't pray for himself. The priest always prays for the other people. That's what the priest does. He's not praying for the other people. He's comparing himself to the worst of the worst, extortioners, unjust, and adulterers, and even the tax collectors. You know, and the tax collector probably probably is all of those. These tax collectors, an extortioner, he's he's unjust, and if he's not an adulterer um, sexually, he's at least an adulterer spiritually, because he's put somebody else before before God. Then it says the tax collector, standing afar off, would not as much even raise his eyes to heaven but beat his breast. The, that Greek, by the way, if you take a look at that, beating his breast, in the Greek, there's actually more tenses than there are in English. You know, like we have past and present, and they've got, they've got like a continuing perfect tense, meaning that he's continually doing this. He's just constantly, constantly beating his breast and crying out to God. That's the, the tense that's being used there. And he says, he says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. What a neat prayer. What a neat prayer. One of the things we can learn on this is how simple a prayer can be. How very simple a prayer can be. God, just be merciful to me. Just, God, help me. You know, I remember, um, the, remember the old, uh, the old country western song, Jesus Take the Wheel? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's kind of a funny song, but it's a great song. It's theologically correct. It really is. It's theologically correct. You get an A plus in Theology 101 with that song. It's that you're going along and all of a sudden something happens. It's like, Jesus, just take the wheel. I can't do this myself. There's nothing I can do anymore. I, I found myself in a situation. There's no way out. There's nothing that I can do to fix this. So Jesus, just, just take the wheel. And that's what, this, that's what this, this tax collector is saying. He says, he's not even raising up his eyes to heaven as if he's not worthy. And he's just saying, God, just be merciful. Just be merciful to me. You know, it's interesting. It's almost exactly what the, what the thief on the cross. Remember there was a good thief and a bad thief? What's a good thief, right? There's no such thing as a good thief. We call him a good thief because he does this. He turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. It's basically the same thing. Just have, have mercy on me. He's not even listing all of his sins, all the things that he did, but he's basically just turning to Jesus and just says, would you remember me? Would you have mercy on me? 
What a simple prayer. Then Jesus concludes, he says, I tell you this, this man went down to his house justified, he's talking about the tax collector, rather than the other, the Pharisee. And then Jesus gives us a great line, which we ought to have on the back of our cars like a bumper sticker. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He who humbles himself will be exalted. So, like I said, it's a pretty straightforward parable, right? And there's, there's a, But there's still a few things we can learn. One of the things I point out in this, and it's, and it's really not in here, but I, I like pointing it out, is that the purpose of this parable goes back to the very beginning. The parable was to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. There's a couple of things we can learn there. One is that often when you become self-righteous, when you start thinking that God's okay with you, Right? And, and here's the thing, we really should. I mean, the Bible tells us that we are the children of God. It tells us that we are part of the body of Christ. And there's parts of the New Testament that says that Jesus says, I now call you friends, okay? So we're friends of God. We sing, I'm a friend of God. That's one of the songs that they sing in contemporary churches. So there's, there's something to be said that we are righteous. We have the righteousness of God. And, and that's because of what Jesus did. But don't you know that often what happens is we start thinking that maybe it's because of something that we do. You know, maybe the, the reason that we're a friend of God, maybe the reason that we're a member of the body of Christ is something that I did. And actually, it's what Jesus did. It's what, it's what Jesus did. I mean, we're fortunate enough, we're blessed, we ought to be humbled of the billions of people in the earth we've been able to not only hear the gospel, but respond to the gospel. That makes us a chosen people. That's exactly what the Bible says. We've been, we've been grafted in with, with Israel. We've, we're now part of this grand plan of salvation that God has. And that's, that's kind of humbling. It's kind of humbling. We've been, we've been picked, which is humbling. But all so often, we start thinking that we're a little better. And it's all, and here's the thing, it's almost inevitable. It, it really is. It's almost inevitable. And I think it's something we need to struggle all the time with. It really do. It's, it's a good message to the church. That's why this parable, see, this parable is not written to the Pharisees. This parable is really written to the people that are reading the Bible. And the people that are reading the Bible are Christians. They're us. We're reading this. And Jesus is reminding us that all too often it's so easy for us to start thinking like this Pharisee. You see, we may not say these things. God, I thank you that I'm not like these other men, the extortioners, the unjust, adulterers, or even the people that work at the IRS, okay? But we can think it. You see, we may not say it, but it's really easy to start, start thinking it sometimes. And, and that's unfortunate, because what happens is we, we miss the blessing at the end, because at the end of this parable, Jesus says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I want to be on the exalted side. I don't want to be humbled by God. I, see, I've been humbled by many people. That's not hard. Once, <laughs> once I, was, I was speaking at a, uh, at a conference. It's a very big conference, and I was so excited because I got on the main stage. You know, when I first started speaking at this, this organization, I was in the basement. I was in the basement speaking to like 10, 12, 15 people. And, and, and our organization was doing well, and I finally got invited on the, on the main stage. I got invited on the main stage. And guess who I had to follow? James Dobson. James Dobson, the number one author in Christendom, the guy that has this ministry in Colorado Springs, that's housed in a 15-story building, the man that's on Larry King at night and Fox News and NBC and ABC and CBS. I follow this guy. And so he's getting up, and as they're applauding, they're saying, and now I'd like to introduce Ken Baird. It's like, who's this guy? It's pretty humbling. It's pretty humbling. So the point is that I don't mind. I, I, I've been humbled by man. That's easy. It's easy to be humbled by man. Anytime I used to, I was a runner, anytime I would run in a race and I finished second or third, I was humbled, right? Um, I remember I was a swimmer. I was a swimmer in college. I actually got a scholarship. I was pretty good in high school. Well, the problem when you get to college, 
all of the people that are really good, I'm now swimming against you. And I remember my very first meet, and I'm looking at the blocks, and I'm standing up there in my swimsuit, and I look over, and I said, wait, I know this guy. He beat me in state two years ago. I know this guy, too. He beat me last year. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm all of a sudden, I'm racing against the very best. The wrong way to put your hat, bro. That's right, and, and it's, it's very humbling. It's, yeah. it's very humbling. All of a sudden, you realize you're, just, you're not quite as good as you think you are. But, but Jesus says there's something good about being humble. But what we don't want to do is we don't want to be humbled by God. We don't want to be humbled by God. We don't want God having to say, you know what? That's one of my stupid kids, you know? I'm going to have to spend a little time in doing some remedial action with my stupid kid, you know? I've got a grandson this year that's, he's not stupid at all. He's a very bright boy. But he's got to go to summer school. He's got to go to summer school. And I remember, that that's no fun. I remember everybody else gets to play during the summer and play sports and play baseball and hang out with your friends and do all those types of things. And there's a few kids that had to go to summer school. I probably should have. You probably should have. I, I probably should have stayed in school all year. Yeah, exactly. So so that's that's being humbled by God. Now here's the thing. There's one more thing I want to mention um, in this, and I think it's, it's just as important, but it's often missed, is, is this parable is focused to those who trust in themselves. This parable is not focused, or nor is it a lesson, nor is it necessarily an example of people that are like tax collectors and how to pray. This is not a lesson in prayer, okay? I, I like it that a short prayer was honored, God be merciful to me, a sinner. But all too often, we tend to feel like this tax collector before God. And I don't think that's necessarily appropriate. You know, I've, I've heard too many sermons, I've had too many people tell me that I'm nothing more than a worthless worm. I'm nothing more than a sinner. That I've got that the only thing that I can do is what God does in me, that there's nothing good in me anymore. And what happens is they're not rightly dividing the scriptures because that's true about the old me. That's true about the old me. There was nothing that was good in me, okay? I was born in sin, and I'm so glad that Jesus came and saved me. But I am now saved. The Bible says that I have right standing with God. The Bible says that we are kings and priests, that we are joint heirs with Jesus, okay? So we don't necessarily have to get beat up all the time and think of ourselves as a lowly worm, that the only thing we could possibly do is not even look up to heaven because we're not even worthy of using the name Jesus, but just beat our breast and say, just be merciful to me because I'm just a sinner. Mm -hmm. No, if that's, if that's your case, then we need, we need some remedial action on you. We need to get you in a self-help group. We need to get you in a group of 11 people where you confess that I used to be a sinner, but I'm now a saint, okay? And, and we, need, we need some help because all too often we, we can read this or we can read other things in the scriptures and feel that God thinks of us that way. And that's not how God thinks of us at all. You know, uh, um, there's, I love reading the Psalms, and, and David expresses it so well. Uh, King David, uh, King David will sometimes just express himself that that he that he knows God is is thinking of him. Isn't that what we talked about last night? That God is thinking of him. That God has him on his mind. That God's thoughts are constantly towards us. See, God loves us. If if God was willing to have this plan where Jesus would come to earth and actually be the Lamb of God and pay the penalty for our sins. That means he, he loves us. God cares about us. He doesn't think of us as, as worms that are unworthy. He thinks of us as children of God. That's why he's done so much for us. That's why he, he puts us in a place that we get to be a member of the, of the body of Christ. Paul talks about the body of Christ, and he says that the, the hand has no right to look at another member of the body and say, I'm better than you. You know, the, the body of Christ is very egalitarian. It's very egalitarian, meaning what? We're all children of God. We're all children of God. The ground is level. 
It is. It is. It is. And the, the cross is a great leveling field, too. We all come to God the same way. We all come as sinners, unworthy, but we all come through the, the cross. And once we're there, we are the redeemed. We are now the redeemed. We are no longer just an old sinner. Okay, we are now the saved by grace. We're part of it. So this parable, like I said, I told you that there's an opportunity, even in a parable like this, that's actually pretty straightforward. It really is. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty clear, but it's easy, even in a parable like this, to sometimes get off the path and think that the only way that God is going to be happy with you, if you're like this tax collector who was extorting the people, you know, who was, who was unjust. I mean, tax collectors were unjust. That's how they got their money. And the only way that we can be right with God is somehow to act like this tax collector and feel that we're completely unworthy of even lifting up our eyes and looking up towards heaven. And that's not the point of the parable at all. The point of the parable is exactly what the first and the last verse say. I love this parable. He spoke this parable to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. That happens very often. And then the last verse is great. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So, but let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you, Lord. We thank you for health. We thank you for wellness. We thank you, Lord, for the skill that the doctors have. We pray for our... You've been listening to Faith Dialogue with Pastor Ken Baer, recorded live at Celebrate Seniors, a ministry of Faith Dialogue. You can listen to or watch all of the recordings at Faith Dialogue by going to www.faithdialogue.org.